Good afternoon and welcome to this Charity Trustee Management Update webinar. My name is Mike Farwell, I'm Head of Charities and Education at James Cooper Preston. We act for over 200 charities and I'm joined today by one of my partner colleagues, Alex Peel. So this is the latest in a series of webinars that we've been doing for charities. I'm pleased to say that we have a, a wide variety of people on the call, including our trustees and the management of charities. Um, the aim is to cover the session in around about 30 minutes, so we've very much a, a whistle-stop tour. And there is a facility, hopefully, on your screens that you can ask questions, which we will deal with at the end. In terms of the session structure, we're focusing on four key areas. What you need to know about financial resilience, um, very topical at the moment. We're going to cover developments at the Charity Commission. Uh, thirdly, how to help ensure good governance at your charity. And then finally, we'll conclude with other big issues uh, for charities, things that we're seeing affecting um, our charity clients at the moment. So if we kick off with um, financial resilience, many of you will, will know um, about problems with the Kids Company charity a few years ago. It's been very well uh, publicised. But I think perhaps the time has come to move on from the Kids Company. There have been uh, some other um, charities which have got into financial difficulties, perhaps none quite as famous as that one. So the factors that are affecting financial resilience and how your charity performs financially uh, clearly varies amongst charities, but some of the key issues that we're seeing, austerity, economic conditions, so for example the impact on investment returns, um, how technology is affecting you, increased demand from beneficiaries, which is often an issue when economic times are hard, uh, and finally the many international issues, whether it's Brexit, refugees, or the seemingly unstable world, which we operate today. Today, we could quite easily have picked a number of other factors, but they seem to be perhaps some of some of the key ones. In terms of charity commission guidance, it's fair to say there's a huge variety of guidance on this topic. There's a document, Charity Governance, Finance and Resilience: 15 Questions Trustees Should Ask, which we'll come on to in a moment. There's also the Charity Finance Trustee Essentials document, and the, the real question is how resilient. Is your charity, and I think it's a reasonable place to start. We'd just be to, to look through the 15 questions in the financial resilience document, and sort of talk through some of the some of the key issues there. So, what effect is the current economic climate having on your charity? Um, so, it may well be that you need to look at your income sources. There may be particular risks that have arisen as a result of the economic climate. Um, or, you know, ultimately it could be that in a situation with dire that you might need to consider whether to carry on with your activities. Secondly, are you financially strong enough to continue to provide for your beneficiaries? So there would be a question of making sure that you know the information so you've got regular management accounts, for example, and predict what might, what might happen um, into the future, um, particularly in connection with your income streams. Thirdly, do we know what impact the social and economic climate is having on our donors and support for our charity? Clearly, this has been a big theme um, in recent years. Um, it's fair to say that the economic climate has had some impact, I think, on, on, on donors. Uh, I think it may well be that charities that are supported, for example, by grant-making trusts will find that the reduced investment returns in those trusts may have had an impact on the amounts that trusts are able to donate. And it may, of course, be that one needs to rethink your fundraising strategy if one of your uh, donors um, is unable to support you either at all or at levels you've been used to in the past. Fourthly, what is our policy on reserves? This, of course, is a webinar uh, entirely of its own, but we did one um, this topic last year. Subject of great uh, debate, um, I think there was a survey in the Charity Finance magazine recently which demonstrated that there's a huge variety of reserves levels that charities have. So it would be a question of working out what your policy is and what your actual level of reserves is at the moment. Uh, fifthly, are we satisfied with our banking arrangements and current and future investment policy? I, mean, I think it makes sense to periodically review one's banking arrangements just to make sure that they're appropriate. That may be in connection with the routine day-to-day -day banking or it may be to do um, with loans for example if you're a charity that has some loans or if you're a charity that's fortunate enough to have some investments it may well be a question of reviewing what your policy is typically uh, charities um, will, will have 
uh, with investments often have some shares, but there's a question perhaps of um, whether you should just have shares or whether it should be property or looking at a whole range of potential uh, mixes. So uh, something important to look at. Um, item six, have we reviewed our contractual commitments? So this might include office leases, for example. It might be that you could work with other organizations to help save costs on some of these contractual commitments. And what will your obligations be um, um, for um, these contracts if they were to come, to come to an end? What are the termination periods on these contracts? So important to understand what your actual contractual commitments are. Uh, for those of you that have good contracts to deliver um, public services, again, this follows on a similar theme of understanding what your contractual commitments are. And I think we're increase, increasingly seeing that in these contracts there are often uh, potentially significant financial penalties if you don't meet certain key performance indicators and, of course, uh, potential reputational risks if you don't achieve them. So really um, a good thing to do is to review those contracts to make sure you understand the terms. Uh, pension schemes, again topical recently, different types of pension schemes uh, in the um, education sector for example, final salary schemes are often uh, very common. In other sectors it may be that recent changes include the implementation of a new pension scheme, that the new auto-enrollment uh, rules which have affected organisations over a period of time. I think one of the key themes on pension schemes is to make sure that you take specialist science because it's a very complex area. Those of you with um, permanent endowment, maybe a question of reading what you may or may not be able to do with those investments. Item 10, are we an effective trustee body? Uh, that's something that Alex will be covering in one of the later sections, so I'll, I'll skip over that, but it goes without saying that um, the charities need to make sure that their trustee body is working in an effective way. Um, item 11, do we have adequate safeguards in place to prevent fraud, as we'll see a bit later, this is a big focus for the Charity Commission, making sure you have financial controls and procedures and that these are properly documented. Um, and these often need to take account of uh, the impact of technology. Are we making the, the best use of financial benefits we have as a charity? So I think the most obvious item here would be a consideration of tax relief. So the two biggest reliefs are, are, are uh, rates and, uh, and, and gift aid been various changes in the rules there, but also perhaps assessing whether there are any other entitlements that you might be able to, to obtain either from government or, or other bodies. Are we making best use of staff and volunteers? I mean, one could say that in the context of staff this is relevant to, to any organisation, so I think charities are just the same as any organisations uh, in the public or, or private sectors. So, you know, making sure that you keep up to date with things like uh, flexible working. And, of course, in the charity context, volunteers are often important in making a big contribution uh, to the charity. Um, unpaid volunteers, of course, but they do need to be managed well. Collaboration with other charity um, is, a, is a big theme. I think we've certainly seen a big increase that in, in recent years, although perhaps the number of actual formal mergers with other charities has been less than expected. That may be, in some circumstances, essential a sensible option to um, maintain financial resilience. And finally, are we making the best use of our property? So if you're a charity that's fortunate enough to have uh, some property, um, are you perhaps sharing it with others? Is it possible to renegotiate terms or even possibly sell a property if you're fortunate enough to own one? So the whole variety of different issues there that you consider, you consider in the context of financial resilience. And I think um, charity trustee board meetings are often have uh, very busy agendas, but uh, if you're able to slot in there at some stage discussion of those those questions or possibly spread them over a number of meetings, I think that would be a good um, um, use of time. So I'll now I'll hand over to Alex, who's going to cover developments at the Charity Commission. Alex. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, and as Mike mentioned, the next section really looks at the current developments or sort of ongoing developments with the Charity Commission, some of their recent publications and some of the key themes that are coming out. Um, the first uh, slide which you've got on your screen uh, covers a few of the sort of more, more general themes really in terms of where things are going. Um, I think the first uh, bullet point there, risk-based regulation becoming more proactive. Um, really as a result of a number of things that have come up over the last few years, the Charity Commission are really looking to look at risk. Where, where, where do the risks lie in charities and, and, and base regulation on that? 
Um, the second um, amending strategy to a enrich enablement offering. What does that mean? Really, that means really just them helping charities to do the things that those charities are wanting to do. Um, they really they're, 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 they're trying to focus on helping charities get on with the, the work that they're trying to do. Like everybody else, uh, reliance on digital new services are coming out. New services have already come out. So, for example, it's now possible to register a charity online. The Charity Commission's actually been quite good over the years in being at the sort of fourth, more, more at the forefront of what can be done online. So it's been possible to do annual returns online for a while now, upload accounts for a while now, but more is coming in this space. And the fourth bullet point there, consultation on charging. Um, this is obviously subject to government approval, but that would be a way for the Charity Commission to raise funds for their work. Um, so things like um, filing annual returns, for example, you could be required to, to pay for that in the future, very much like companies do at the moment when they file various documents at the company's house. So that's uh, some of the key themes. Um, Moving on then, serious incident reporting. Now, there's always been a responsibility on trustees to report various things that happen in their charities. Some of these are defined and there are various lists within uh, Charity Commission guidance on what should be reported. Um, now, where income is over £25,000, charities must confirm that all serious incidents have been reported. The Commission carried out a consultation towards the back end of last year um, looking at serious incident reporting and they had a number of responses um, as you'll see on the screen there. Um, I think generally speaking the, the, the new style of guidance was welcomed but there was some sort of reservations still about how reporting happened and the timing of that reporting. Um, and we're, we're still awaiting some further guidance on um, this area from the Charity Commission. That's due out sort of any day now, really. Hopefully, and we're, what we're anticipating is a digital form to streamline the reporting process and assist in the processing of those reports. Um, I think other changes include making it more clear what charities need to report perhaps I think adding some things to the list of areas that need to be reported but also taking some away as well perhaps coming back to that thing that we started with the risk and where does that risk actually lie. Fraud is always a, uh, a key area and uh, countering fraud is just as relevant for charities as it is for any other organisation. Um, <clears throat> The um, charity sector counter fraud group has been launched and this is a, a partnership group of over 30 charities and professional bodies. I've got the web link up on the screen there and it's worth having a look at. It looks at um, guidance for charities on, on fraud, how to spot it, how to, to put in place um, uh, ways of mitigating that. And there's uh, a plan for a National Charity Fraud Awareness Week later on in the year, probably at the end of October, covering five different issues in relation to charity fraud. They're also looking at developing and making available to charities an online fraud awareness toolkit. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Um, the next couple of slides um, We'll run through uh, some recent publications that might be of interest to, to the people on this webinar. Um, the first of those is a report that was published last year, Charities in Financial Distress, and this looked at five key areas which indicated that charities might be in financial distress. Um, they were uh, insolvency, low reserves, staff redundancy, downsizing property, and um, negative pension funds that might not be um, particularly unique to charities in financial stress, distress because a lot of uh, pension funds are often negative but um, certainly the other factors uh, were seen as key indicators and the report goes on to 
look at the key the key things that charities should do if they're experiencing some of these things. There was a, a study published on the quality of accounts and the disclosures around public benefit. Um, interesting this, um, I think there, there's quite a big difference between um, charities who are subject to independent examination and or audit and charities which are below the threshold where they have to have uh, formal reporting. And interestingly, only 75% of registered charities passed a, a basic test on the reporting that they had done. There have been various new templates issued to help charities with their financial reporting. So if you are a charity who, who we don't prepare the financial statements for, or you don't use a firm of accountants to prepare the financial statements, it's worth having a look at some of those templates, not necessarily just to fill them in, but to provide guidance on the um, things that you should be including in your financial statements and the things that you should be including in your annual reports. And the third bullet point up there, uh, modified audit opinions. This is looking at where charity financial statements had what we used to call in the old days qualified audit reports um, and looked at 97 reported qualified audit reports in the period and sort of looked at the reasons for that. So uh, pretty much half of those were due to lack of audit evidence being available. Um, 45 out of the 97 were due to non-compliance with the, the charity SORP and just two were due to incorrectly valued assets or liabilities. Okay, so moving on, um, some further publications. Um, Charity Commission publication 15D looks at the new fundraising disclosures for auditable charities. So this is things, th th these are disclosures that charities are required to do if they're subject to an audit or, or, or they're big enough to need an audit. And there are a number of requirements, but essentially there are agreements that a charity needs to have in place with a third party fundraiser and there are a number of disclosures that the charity needs to include in their trustees report each year. Tackling abuse and mismanagement 2015-2016, another a grand title, that's just the annual report effectively of the, the, the charity commission looking at what they've been doing during that period and looking at their successes in that, that period. Protecting charities funds, uh, detecting fraud against charities, 12 digital questions for trustees. It's a nice, fairly short publication. It's uh, online and covers, it doesn't cover everything, but it's perhaps thought provoking, something for certain trustees or management to have a look at. Obviously covers things like cyber security, but sort of also goes into some other areas, um, looking at things like governance, um, new trustees, etc., and what needs to be done. Charity Commission statement on mission, regulatory approach and values. Um, this is just really looking at the purpose of the Charity Commission. It's a sort of position statement by the Charity Commission on where, where they should be doing things. Um, regulators issue um, joint alert about working with third party fundraisers. Um, again, more information about, uh, about what charities should be doing if they are fundraising. Um, CC20 sets out a good practice and um, sets out some other things that charities can be doing, um, for example, uh, registering with the fundraising regulator. And finally, uh, CC25 uh, has been updated, I think Mike mentioned earlier. It's a good read for all charity trustees and it sort of is an essential document which which can be found on the Charity Commission website looking at the, the role of the trustee and what they, they should be doing. Okay, before we move on to the next section, it's uh, time for you to, to, to get involved. We've got a poll question which uh, Mike will talk us through. So the question is, we've obviously been covering changes at the Charity Commission, um, is how well do you, do you feel your charity is supported by the Charity Commission? So quite a straightforward question. Um, so three options, either very well, partially or not at all. So if we could um, ask you all to, to cast your vote, we'll give you a little bit of time. 
the votes are coming in. A few seconds longer. Okay, so I think we'll we'll close the poll now. So interestingly, the majority of people feel that they um, are partially supported by the Charity Commission. Um, a few think they're not at all supported by the Commission, and um, the number of people saying that they're very well supported is, is is very low indeed. So I think clearly the Charity Commission has picked up on something here, where there is some work to do. And get those percentages up so that um, you know they can feel that charities are well supported by the commission. So thank you very much for voting. So I'll now hand back to Alex, who's going to whiz through uh, some good governance topics. Alex, thanks, Mike. So yeah, the next section is really uh, just looking at uh, good governance of charities. Um, the House of Lords uh, Select Committee on Charities uh, published a report in March this year. Um, it's um, over 100 pages long. It is actually reasonably interesting for those involved in the sector, um, and it's fairly easy to read, and you can, you can get it on the internet, so it might be something that some people want to have a look at. But this report um, looked at a number of uh, charity-related areas and came up with a number of suggestions, recommendations, uh, themes and issues for charities. Some of the things we're not really going to cover today um, looked at um, things like payment of trustees, um, the merger of charities, and the support that charities get. Um, but some of the recommendations we will uh, consider, um, these included regular skills audits, uh, giving trustees access to training, induction training for new trustees, and interestingly, time limits for trusteeships. Um, so one of the themes really coming out of this was, was, was good governance and I think I mean, Mike's mentioned kids company already but I think a lot of the themes in the charitable sector over the last few years have come back to good governance and the role trustees play in that. Um, so um, some of the key things that charities should consider in, in, in looking at this really are things like um, induction training. Um, what does that look like? I know um, from practical experience, both both working with charities and charities I've been involved in, that often when um, charities find a new trustee, they're, they're so uh, grateful to have found a new trustee, they get them along to the meeting and um, they, 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 they sort of don't really want to put them off with, with, with lots of training or with, with any training. Um, but for a trustee to effectively take up that role and perform that role, they will need to have some induction training into, into that charity. What are the key themes? What are the, 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 the key issues that have, have come up? What does it mean to be a trustee if they've not been a trustee for a while? And it's not just induction, really. It's um, also ongoing. Um, again, a lot of charities have trustees who are very, very experienced. They've been in place for a number of years. Um, and they probably think that they know quite a lot about the charity and the, the, the role that they're playing, but everybody could do with a refresh from time to time, and it's important to consider what, what is required for that. And who should do the training? Is it something that a, a charity can do internally? Um, should they go to their professional advisors, perhaps their auditors, lawyers, um, or, or another body, depending on what, trust, what the charity is and what they do? Lack of, enga lack of engagement. Um, in terms of this, I mean, again, most trustees are very diligent about what they do. Um, they spend the time that's needed, but every charity from time to time does have the situation where a trustee doesn't necessarily spend the time that they should do, perhaps they don't turn up to meetings, um, perhaps they don't really perform the role um, in the way that they should do. So, so, so dealing with that and how that's dealt with is a key issue. Responsibilities as a trustee, we, 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 we've sort of mentioned, but again, reminding um, trustees what those responsibilities are. And looking at the training material available, there's a lot of information on the Charity Commission website. It's got a huge amount of resource on there, and most of it you can just download with, with one or two clicks. Um, so if you don't do anything else, I think having a look to see what's available for trustees, for running a charity, looking at um, things like 
um, fundraising reserves, etc., etc., financial resilience, as Mike's mentioned. Um, there's a lot of information there, so to, so do have a look. And then, sort of moving on to the next side, really reviewing the effectiveness of the trustees. Have they performed the role well? Almost a sort of mini appraisal of the trustee body, um, if you like, is is good practice. And as part of that, that might involve looking at the skill set that the trustee have. Does the trustee body have the skills that they need to have? Um, I'm not going to read through all of them, but um, do you have people who understand finance? Do, do, do you have people who understand the marketing and the, the selling aspect of the charity, if that's something the charity does? And the, the, the last bullet point up there, charity objectives and beneficiaries, do enough of the, the, the trustees have expertise in the particular sector that the charity is involved in? Whilst obviously the management will run the charity and the management are responsible for doing that, it's often normally very helpful to have a, a trustee or a few trustees who really do understand the sector and can provide support in that area. So uh, now I'll hand back to Mike, who's going to conclude the webinar by looking at big issues for charities. Thanks very much, Alex. So uh, the exciting news for those of you who are looking forward to your lunch um, is that we've covered a number of these big issues um, already, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but this is a, quite a useful list, I think, on the checklist to make sure that you're addressing the key ones. But I will touch upon a few. Fundraising regulations uh, has been a big theme in recent times with the setting up of the fundraising regulators, so charities that are involved in fundraising really need to be looking closely at that. I think we're seeing that many of our charity clients are reviewing their strategy on a very regular basis. The days of um, producing a strategy uh, for five years and then shoving it in a drawer and five years later putting it out again and reviewing it are over. So I think people are keeping a very uh, firm handle on that to make sure that they're nimble in response to a changing environment. And related to that scenario planning, so what would your charity do if it lost a major income stream, for example, a, a public sector contract? So charities are looking to Rather than sort of dealing with a, a scenario like that when it happens, they're looking to plan ahead to work out what they would do um, if that did happen. Um, income generation uh, on the second side is a big issue for um, charities looking at um, either doing new uh, charitable ventures or trading ventures to raise money. And we're seeing many charities uh, expanding their objects uh, to deal with that. The national living wage is having an impact and will continue to do so over a period of time, not necessarily just in relation to those perhaps earning uh, uh, a low level of wages, but the natural impact of those who may be earning a slightly above the national living wage who may expect to pay a rise in consequence. Um, data protection um, has become a real hot topic in recent times. Next year, the, the new general data protection regulation will come in, so all charities need to look at how they are using data to make sure they comply with that. And that links, I think, with the next point, dealing with continuous technological change, just as it, it, it um, affects all areas of life. Um, it's a question of making sure you understand the impact on your charity, um, not just in the context of any issues that it might create, create, but also the opportunities that some of the new technologies might bring. Um, there has been an increase in philanthropy in recent years, started in the US, has moved across to the UK, where it's some very wealthy individuals who perhaps may be struggling to spend all the money that they've accumulated um, over the years. So um, if you can get into the networks where that might um, create some significant funding for you. For charities with significant sites, we are seeing um, uh, many of them are reviewing their, their sites at the moment. So, for example, in the context of, uh, of a school, let's say, um, you know, possible disposal of any surplus property on the edge of the site. So people are looking at the different options of maximising use of resources. Then finally, I think we often end our webinars with discussion about collaboration. There are over 160,000 charities in the UK. Um, it's a question of looking to see how you can collaborate with other charities, the public sector and, and third parties for, for, for maximum benefit. So, because at the end of the day, it's all about providing a benefit to your, um, providing a public benefit to, to your beneficiaries. So that's some of, the, some of the big issues that affect charities in all sorts of different ways, but hopefully that's been a useful uh, guide. So we'll now move on to questions and answers. So we've had a few questions in. Um, 
someone has asked a question to do with um, advice on um, uh, the usage percentage which is reasonable when considering renting out space as a fundraiser. Um, there isn't any specific guidance in the Charity Commission's guidance on that particular topic and I suppose it partly depends on whether you're looking at it from the context uh, of the charity or possibly um, whether the third party is a fundraiser. It's a third party fundraiser or an, an internal fundraiser. I think it's fair to say that the the way that the Charity Commission ought to look at, look at percentages in this is, is looking at how much income is raised from fundraising and seeing uh, what percentage of income is taken out by cost. So if you if you raise £200,000 through fundraising but you're spending £250,000 of cost, that may not be perceived to be the best use of a charity resources. The, the person who's raised that question, obviously it sounds like um, you know, a, a specific case, they're very welcome to ring Alex and I. Um, so that we we can happily sort of sort you through the, the, the particular issue you have in a bit more detail. Someone has asked um, about the new fundraising regulations in terms of disclosure of fundraising information in the accounts. What year ends does, does that relate to? Alex, are you able to take that one? Um, yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so I mentioned um, that uh, charities um, who are above the audit threshold will be required to do certain things um, in their, well, do, do certain things. One of those was to um, have uh, formal agreements with third party fundraisers. The other is to include information in the trustees report. Um, this comes in from uh, the 1st of November 2016. So the first year end to which it applies, applies is 31st of October 2017. Um, so most most charities um, tend to have December or March year end. So um, certainly any charity with a 31st of December 2017 or 31st of March 2018 year end will be affected. And uh, obviously those with later year ends will be able to see what other people have started to put to, to cover this. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Alex. And uh, I think there's just one final question, which is, is registration with the... Uh, fundraising regulator voluntary or mandatory? The answer to that question is that it is uh, voluntary. The invoices that the fundraising regulator has been sending out make it look as if it's not very very optional, but the reality is it's voluntary. Um, I think what we're seeing is that whilst legally it is uh, voluntary, um, the Charity Commission is strongly encouraging it, so I think clearly it's something that's important to the Charity Commission, it's probably likely to be important to you. And I think we will see over a period of time that many um, potential donors to the charity will be asking about whether you're registered with the, with the fundraising regulator. So um, I think rather than having an unfortunate incident at a later date when somebody wants to give you some money but are reluctant to do so because you're not, you're not registered, you know, I would encourage you to seriously consider um, registering with the fundraising regulator, and if you choose not to, sort of do so in the, in the full knowledge of the potential consequences if you if you don't do that. So, I think that's all the questions that we've had. So, um, there's the contact details there, so that hopefully useful to um, the person who asked the question about property. If you want to give Alex and myself a call, um, the um, Webinar will be on our website shortly, so those of you that enjoyed it so much that you'd like to listen to it again, it will be there in all its glory, or perhaps more, more usefully, if there's anyone in your organisation who you think might find it useful, you're very welcome to direct them to it. So um, hopefully you found that useful. As ever with these things, very much a whistle-stop tour. We appreciate that everyone is very busy, but hopefully that's given you a few uh, things to think about. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to Alex for joining me. And um, we hope to um, you'll join a webinar at some stage in the future with us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.